Greetings from Stanford University. I'm Bill Barnett, professor at the Stanford Doors School of Sustainability and the Stanford Graduate School of Business. I'm Ingrid Ackerman, an undergraduate in the School of Engineering. And we have with us here today a couple of our professors uh, of climate science. Hi, I'm Chris Field. I'm the director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment and a climate scientist in the new Stanford Door School of Sustainability, where I work on climate impacts and climate change solutions. I'm Morgan O'Neill. I'm an assistant professor also in the Stanford Door School of Sustainability, where I study severe weather and climate. Wow. And thanks so much, Morgan and, and Chris, uh, for for coming and just uh, uh, had a uh, conference on uh, climate. And uh, uh, we'd like to hear from you about maybe what the highlights of the conference were. Well, I might start out by just saying it was incredibly fun. I really appreciate the opportunity that the GSB and the SDSS created for us to bring together a group of leading thinkers about where we are in our understanding of climate change and its risks and how we think about using that understanding to do a better job moving forward. And so if I can jump in for some context, the title of the conference was Climate Science in Service of Climate Solutions. Um, and it brought together everyone across the spectrum from academia to private industry um, to public institutions. Something exciting about the Stanford Door School, among many aspects that are so exciting, is the potential creation of a future climate science department. Very few of these exist nationwide. And one of the challenges in building a, such a department is defining climate science. Who is the audience? Who does it serve? What kind of science is it? Are we thinking about just theory in such a department? Or do we value, or do we value applied science? And so this theme of climate science in service of climate solutions is really kind of loading the dice to see if we can embrace applied climate science uh, to serve society better. And one of the things that was really fun about the conference is that Morgan and I each kind of wrote down our top priorities for people we would love to hear from on this set of topics. And we were incredibly uh, pleased to see that almost everyone accepted all the way from people who work on kind of the nuts and bolts of the way the climate models work, all the way to people who think about the economic impacts of a changing climate. That's interesting. So I gather from that that climate science is quite broad. Uh, may maybe maybe uh, uh, you guys could give us an example uh, or two of some of the findings that we learned about at the conference. Well, I'll speak to one that's in more in Morgan's area than in mine, but there was a, a really interesting presentation about how we can use artificial intelligence to improve weather forecasts. We have lots and lots of examples of, of uh, the, the way the weather unfolds over important time periods. And uh, using artificial intelligence, we can now find a way to dramatically speed up by a factor of like 10,000, how long it takes to do a climate model output. And, and by being able to have this amazing speed up, we can really explore the the possible space of what the future is going to look like much more thoroughly. Uh, but what we need to do is figure out whether that works or not. And that was the exciting tension that, that the presentation on AI enhanced climate models left us with. We can do really a lot and they seem to work pretty good, but now we need to figure out if they're really going to be transformative, especially at periods longer than the week or so when the, um, when, when we have good confidence in them. Can I push on that a little, Chris? Are we getting good enough because of AI that we could help people in these parts of the world who are often so terribly affected by severe climate events? We've seen what's happened, obviously, in Pakistan, and uh, but really all over the world. And often the poorest people just get hit so hard. Uh, is it possible for us to maybe intervene in advance now? Well, that's very much the goal to figure out if we can do a better job of things like projecting exactly where a hurricane is going to land or how intense it's going to be uh, when there is extreme rainfall, as Pakistan experienced last year, what areas will be impacted and how much of a problem they'll be. 
Were there any other solutions that came up at the conference um, that were of particular interest? Well, you know, the the conference did not focus on solutions as, as the sole kind of output of, of the talks. We were tasked with bringing together leaders in the climate science or climate science adjacent space to discuss the interplay between, you know, fundamental climate science, which as Bill mentioned, is very broadly defined. That actually means something different to every person. Uh, and climate solutions, which often are, you know, not in the pol uh, not in the science realm at all, but can be found in the technology and policy spheres. And so we we had a really broad array of speakers, kind of exploring this back and forth between uh, the fundamentals and applications. I believe one of our speakers was um, one of our speakers was Michael Greenstone, a professor at the University of Chicago, who talked about the social cost of carbon. And it is really valuable to put a dollar amount on carbon emissions because I believe he made this point directly in his talk. Uh, if there isn't a dollar amount on carbon emissions and we only see dollar amounts tied to, you know, Ad adaptation and mitigation, those are always going to be the biggest number because there's no number attached to, you know, the cost of emissions. And so hearing that perspective and how climate science can help quantify emissions and then practitioners like himself can turn that into something that we can work with um, economically was, was really valuable. And a lot of people found that perspective really exciting. You know, that's interesting you're saying that, Morgan. I remember when when I was uh, a young student, being a little taken back that we could put dollar amounts on features of the natural world, how does that help us to actually uh, come up with solutions or solve problems? It, uh, in, your, in your answer, you, you talked about those as being connected. What is it about having a dollar amount on carbon that makes it that we can um, solve the problem? Well, part of it is that this the scenario of business as usual is not a no cost scenario. And so to suggest that adaptation and mitigation are too expensive and business as usual is better because it doesn't cost us anything is completely false. It's it's extremely expensive for human society, both in rich and poor countries to experience climate change because we certainly did not develop these societies in the climate we're moving into. We're not prepared agriculturally, economically. Uh, but all we know, you know, before this, this interesting um, work that Michael Greenstone and others are doing, all we know is that adaptation and mitigation do cost money. So you know, we need to quantify what business as usual is costing us and that is far from uh, free. Oh, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. And uh, yeah, go ahead, Ingrid. And if I can jump in with another point there, the reason why putting a price on carbon is so important is because right now carbon emissions are a negative externality. So countries, corporations, et cetera, are emitting carbon into the atmosphere. And right now there's no penalty for doing so, but they're, that's sort of the, the, one of the root causes of global climate change that we need to cut off. And so putting a price on that and making the externality internalized would help uh, close off the, the root of the problem. Oh, that's and there's interesting. still a lot of controversy about how you calculate this number. During the Trump administration, there was a proposal that the social cost of carbon that Morgan's been talking about should be something like $2 per ton. And that was the cost purely for people in the United States from a limited subset of the sectors that are sensitive to climate impacts. And the really nice thing about Michael Greenstone and the Climate Impact Lab's work is that they do a global scale calculation that incorporates in a very mathematically robust way a much broader range of impacts, including impacts on health, on labor productivity, agriculture, uh, water resources, things that we really care about. And even though they come up with a really high number, it's still far from complete because there are many sectors that we still haven't figured out how to include. I see. And so coming up with this number doesn't in itself give us the uh, the fix that you're talking about, Ingrid, but we can't get to that fix unless we know the number. 
we got to know the price. Yeah, at least we can all share a common language between the costs of action and the costs of inaction. At least we, we have a, a single unit that we can use to compare. That's really well put, Morgan. Thanks. And that really gets to the heart of the purpose of this conference, joining climate scientists who are doing the work with the quantitative numbers and the climate dynamic models with the people in policy and economics who are then able to take the science and connect it to policy and economics, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, we have time for just one more comment from each of you. As you as you look back over all the different papers in the conference, what was your what was your uh, uh, sort of most uplifting takeaway from the experience? My most uplifting takeaway was in a presentation by Steve Davis, who's at UC Irvine, about the climate impacts of aviation, which for most academics are by far by far the largest part of their emissions footprint, and and he went systematically through all the things that airline, airplane companies, airlines, and um, customers can do to uh, decrease emissions related to aircraft travel. And, and the picture was not entirely rosy. It's still a very challenging problem with lots of new technology needed. But I was, I was pleased to see the, a good set of options, including ways to... Um, plan the timing of flights, the elevation of flights, the routing to meaningfully decrease my own environmental footprint. Oh, interesting. Morgan? I like to thread that <clears throat> traveled through several presenters' talks regarding the embrace of industry in seeking solutions to climate problems, as well as just to understand fundamental climate science better. Uh, this is not just among uh, companies like NVIDIA, but also insurers and reinsurers. Just this, this recognition that industry is the biggest lever we have, probably, other than policy, but you know, policy is <laughs> less predictable uh, and less monotonic. Uh, so we just saw example after example in a number of talks of companies uh, making breakthroughs and and I find that super exciting because in the academy, you know, we do we do research. We often do very siloed research in our labs. We train a, a finite number of students every year. But ideally, our links to industry and the back and forth that we can have with industry is going to be where all of the action happens because they, they're such big players. And so it was really encouraging to see companies that maybe wouldn't at first blush have any skin in the game, recognize that they in fact do, we all do, and invest accordingly. And invest in a way that recognizes the justice implications of climate in addition to the purely economic implications. Well, that's incredible. And that was coming from the businesses themselves. That's right. Yeah, and yeah, that's important. Very encouraging. That's very important. Well, Morgan, thank you very much. Chris, thank you very much. And Ingrid, always great working with you on this podcast. And for you listeners, until next time. The Stanford Initiative on Business and Environmental Sustainability podcast series is sponsored by the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Music by Charged Particles. That's Caleb Hutzler, Mike Rock, and John Krosnick.